A number of years ago, when I was pastoring in Joliet, Illinois, we had a Christian group, Christian group, come to our church. And the purpose of them coming to our church was to deal with financial planning for your life. A part of what they did was a trust fund, long-term accounts, wills. My wife and I drove an hour and a half a few weeks later, an hour and a half north of, north of Chicago, and we uh, wrote a will with a trust. And several years went by, and there were changes in our life. Our children were a little older, and so we were going to evaluate our will uh, to make sure that things were in order at this stage in our life. We took the will to a lawyer we had known for many years, good lawyer, Jewish lawyer, very, very dependable. I gave him the will, we came back a week later, and I sat down with him, my wife and I were across the desk from him, and he looked at me and very soberly said, Pastor, do you not trust your wife? I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you realize if you die, your wife will not have the freedom to make financial decisions. You have, with this will and this trust, put her in a position where there will always be another trustee, and that trustee will make her financial decisions. I said, how did I do that? He said, because you went to the assembly line will and trust company. Now, I'm not faulting that company. I am saying that I didn't know what I was dealing with. By the same token, people, when they work with us, we count on them to be personally concerned for us, not generally able to make decisions in an arena. So today, as we read the story of Joseph, Joseph has gotten several raw deals, as we would say. His brothers, he then ended up in the home of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. Then Potiphar threw him in the prison, and everything seemed to go eventually in the right direction. Except today, we find out that when he finally interprets the dream of the baker and the butler, who are the key to him getting out, the primary reason Joseph is in prison is because he is going to meet one person who will eventually get him to the throne. That's why, if you'll notice on the screen, there are no chance meetings in the will of God. Someone who continually crosses your path, it is God's way of saying this person and their future or your future are woven together in some respect. And so when we meet people, we need to recognize the hand of God in bringing us across one another's paths. In the case that we come to today, the butler was going back to the throne, and Joseph made one request of him. Let's notice in Genesis chapter 40, if you have your Bibles, notice, if you will, please, Genesis 40, verse 12. And Joseph said to the butler, this is the interpretation of your dream. The three branches are three days. Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. Pause for a moment. Obviously, there had been an attempt on Pharaoh's life, and from the way the story unfolds, we can assume, we don't know, but we can assume that the baker was the guilty person. The butler was not. He's restored to his position. Here's Joseph's one request. 
But remember me when it is well with you. And please show kindness. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house, prison house. For indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. Drop down, if you will, please, to verse 23, the last verse. Genesis 40, 23, yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Forgot him for how long? Look at Genesis 41. Remember, the chapter divisions were not in the original text. They were supplied later for printing purposes. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And we will simply stop in the middle of that verse. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, as we come to you today, all of us have been wounded by the careless actions of other people. Their thoughtlessness, their inconsideration, their ingratitude. We know that as human beings, we are social people. And you yourself said it is not good that man should be alone. At the same time, Father, putting relationships together is often a difficult challenge in life. Simply because all of us recognize that there are people that we just feel we can't trust. In some ways, we become distrusting and cynical of good people. And our concern for self-protection and fear of being wounded causes us to either put up images or walls that in a very real sense hinder good relationship. We would ask this morning as we open our Bibles and consider this scene and this subject that you would help us to learn the right truths and not become skeptical, cynical, critical, and withdrawn. Give us wisdom as to the lessons that are most important so that when it comes to relating to other people and counting on them for our future, that we know who to trust, what to trust, and recognize that ultimately our faith cannot be in man. It must be in you. We ask this in Jesus' name and on the authority of your word, as we shall see today. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Warren Wiersbe, I think most of you know that name. Warren Wiersbe, writing on this particular uh, subject, makes the following statement concerning Joseph. God permitted Joseph to be treated unjustly and helped him in prison to build certain qualities into his life, to prepare him for the task that lay ahead. And I added this thought because this is true. To keep Joseph in protective custody if you think about it, this is an important factor in what took place. If Joseph went to Pharaoh the same day the butler went to Pharaoh, you would never have heard of Joseph. What Joseph had to offer wasn't needed at that moment. So Joseph would have come, he would have gone, it wouldn't even be an issue. He might have even gone back to the promised land. But he needed to be near Pharaoh on the day that Pharaoh dreamed his dream. And the butler needed to then put it together and call for Joseph because in the divine purpose of God, Joseph's skill in interpreting was critical for the future of Egypt, 
the future of Israel and our future as well in a very real sense. So what you have going on in this scene is you have God bringing Joseph to a point of, and I called it, disappointment. Disappointment, all of us have to deal with it. We have a letdown. Things didn't turn out like we expected. And we sometimes say to ourselves, God failed me. He failed us unless there's something we learn in the sorrow, suffering, and loss. And in the case that is set before us, the Bible is very clear that there were some lessons Joseph still had to learn. For example, let us think for a moment, if Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt, before the two years passed, Joseph would not have seen this as the hand of God and would have missed seeing God's work in his life and he might have become a very arrogant man. When Joseph comes to power, Joseph has absolute humility, submission to Pharaoh even though he has saved Pharaoh's throne. So there is not any arrogance and not only that, there is no resentment. No resentment in the jail, no resentment toward Potiphar. Think of what he could have done. Let's take another scene. Esther, Mordecai, and Haman. Haman intended them wrong, and it was the decision of Ahasuerus to destroy Haman. But Mordecai and Esther the queen could have retaliated Always there is the realization God sees a much, much bigger picture than we do. And so it's very difficult for us to decide, I know what God is doing today. We really can say more realistically, I see what God was doing yesterday. I cannot read the future. Sometimes I can't even interpret the present. But I can look back and see the hand of God. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, God has made everything beautiful in His time. In His time. In His time. There are several things that God does when He delays in our life. We're expecting something to happen. We say, what is God doing? Why did the door get shut? I've listed five or six things right here. Number one, God is teaching us a new level of holiness. Number two, God is preparing us for a future task. Number three, God is dealing with our weaknesses. What I'm saying is not in your notes. Number four, God is strengthening our faith. Number five, God always knows the best time and He coordinates life so that at the right moment, everything comes together. I've mentioned before that my first visit when I moved to Michigan to pastor in a hospital, in Butterworth Hospital, I walked in a room, met a woman. Uh, she was probably in her late 30s, mid 40s. And she had pancreatic cancer and had it for years. And after visiting with her and hearing of her pain, I kind of felt, humanly speaking, sorry for her. And as I got ready to leave, I must have expressed some regret for her. She made a statement. I've never heard this from a preacher. I've never read it in a commentary. But she had a right perspective when she said, Pastor, you don't need to worry about me. God never wastes pain. And when I saw her in her medical condition and recognized what she'd lived for many, many years with, I saw a saint. I saw a godly response to a terrible life event. 
I might say this in light of what we're looking at today. God never wastes pain and He never wastes time. What's going on right now is not Joseph treading water. It is not wasted time. This is a chapter that Joseph needs and God will use it to his ultimate end in Joseph's life. If you would, for a moment, take your notes and let me take some time. Oh, I see what happened. Technology is a wonderful friend and it's a terrible enemy. Um, take your Bibles and I want you to turn for just a few moments. I want to direct your attention to Psalm 118 in a few moments. The 118th Psalm. If you were to look at how much time television blocks for a football game, how much time do they block for a football game, typically? Three hours. How long is the average legal football game? It is four 15-minute quarters, 60 minutes. Why does television block three hours for a one-hour football game? <laughs> Wall Street Journal did a study on NFL telecast and said 60 minutes are spent in commercials. 17 minutes are spent in replays. 75 minutes are spent on players standing around, crowd shots, talking in the booth, and the cheerleaders. How much time is wasted time? You see, the truth of the matter is all of our lives are full of wasted time. When we find ourselves living either in a cycle that things are not moving forward or we are trapped in a valley and cannot climb out, how do we view what brought us here? Because it's always going to be people that got us here. Let me share some lessons that I think are biblical in this story. Lesson number one. <clears throat> Joseph needs to learn. God uses people, but we use people. And we have to ask this question. When I am depending on other people, are my efforts actually a substitute for waiting on God or a means to serve God? Am I viewing them as my hope or God as my hope and they're simply His tool? Many years ago, my home pastor told a story of a church that lived in a community that had never had alcohol and their first tavern came into the community. And the prayer warriors of the church kept praying and praying and praying that that tavern would burn down. They called upon an old elderly uh, saint who was known for her prayer line and they asked her to join them. And within a brief period of time, the tavern caught on fire one night and burned to the ground. And as the crowd is standing around, they edged over to her and said, you know, everything changed because we asked you to pray. You're the one God heard. She picked up a book of matches and shook it. She said, yes, but I know how to add feet to my prayers. You know, we without realizing it, 
give people more credit than we're willing to give God. And in a very real sense, people almost are like the eclipse. When the moon blinds us to the sun, people become more important than God. My wife and I, many years ago, I was pastoring here at the time, my wife and I went to a hunting camp that belonged to Henry Ford and uh, Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, yes. And when we got there, we stayed in a cabin, and in the cabin there was a bookshelf. And on that bookshelf, among the books, was a book entitled, When People Are Important and God Isn't. The point of the book was, sometimes, without even us thinking about it, we connect our deliverance to other people, our need of help to other people, and we do not recognize that our real source of help must be God and God alone. Sometimes I have heard over the years missionaries give appeals for the mission field, and you almost get the feeling that poor God is in heaven and can't get the gospel around the world, and if you don't go to the mission field, God is going to fail. I don't know how you see that, but I can't put these two words together, God and fail. There's somehow a disconnect in my mind to that. If God fails, how is He God? Now, I may not be the instrument, but God's not going to fail. God will ultimately succeed. F.B. Meyer, an old English writer, scholar, expositor, said this, and I quote, We cannot live without human sympathy, the human hand, the human voice. We eagerly catch encouragement from a frail extended hand, but men fail us. They severely fail us. They consistently fail us. We should turn for our security from the faltering, fickle, forgetful hand of man to the faithful hand of God. Joseph is going to learn that lesson. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 118. Many years ago, a college professor pointed out, and you've got to remember, many years ago, that means that I would have been talking about the King James Version of the Bible. Everything that you and I hear today didn't exist. All these various translations. But he said, let me take you to the very center verse in all of the Bible. And it is Psalm 118 and verses 8 and 9. Listen to what it says. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. We have the right perspective when we say to God, I need people help if that's your will, if that's your hand. But we never can say, I need people help, and they are the solution. Vain is the help of man. And Joseph is about to learn, because he is about to actually direct the entire affairs of the world. There is no human hand that can help him accomplish his purpose. He could have the nation in revolt. His family may not ever come to see him. 
And if they do, they may never return once they've made the first trip. And his purpose in life, and he doesn't know it just yet, he will stumble on it in a few years. But God is at work through people. And so the question is not, God, what do you want them to do? The question is, God, what are you doing in my life through them? How have you brought them into my life? When I met my wife, my wife was from an entirely different part of the country. Her personality, great personality, but it is far, far different than mine. She would say that mine is far different from hers. Just to give you an illustration, and I have shared this with some of you. We were dating, and when we were dating, I needed some mouthwash and some tooth polish. I wanted to have nice teeth, clean smelling breath. Two blocks from where we were, we walked into a drugstore, walked to it. I told her, wait at the door. And went up to get what I needed, and then I had this brilliant brainstorm. My goodness, wouldn't it be nice if you gave her one of each? And so the pharmacist took another set of both and put it in the back. I carried it back up to where we were sitting. We sat there for maybe another hour, and I walked her to the dorm, and I gave her a bag at the dorm door. And the bags, I told her, I said, this is a token of how I feel about you. <laughs> she opened the bag. I kid you not, my sister was also a student, the one that went to the mission field. My sister was down the hallway from her, and she walked into my sister's room, and she said, what is the problem with your brother? <laughs> and she said to Shelly, she said, my brother is really a little bit naive when it comes to dating. That was true except for two words. I'm sorry, three words. A little bit. <laughs> yes, Wendell. Can we hear a comment from the wife? <laughs> yes, you may have a comment from the wife. <laughs> there was another time when he told him, do you have a serious bone in your body? Because <laughs> all I did was plow. <laughs> it is important to come to the conclusion, and I emphasize it with this one thought, God is never almost sovereign. He's either always sovereign or he is not sovereign. That means when something goes south, as we say, when things go bad, God didn't lose control. God has not been absent, in absentia, A-W-O-L. God is ruling, and God orders difficulty into our lives. Turn to the book of Job, chapter 2. You'll remember that Job is believed to have been the first book of the Bible written. It goes back to the time of Abraham. You say, how do we know it was Abraham's time? Everything described is the time of Abraham, including the fact that the patriarch of the family is also the priest and king of the family, the network. Job, you remember, prays for his children that God would not judge him. This is not in your notes. This is free. God, of course, used the Sabaeans, the Chaldeans, a storm, and by the time you get to the end of chapter 1, Job has lost everything. Chapter number 2, God is going to take Job's health. Drop down, if you will, in Job chapter 2, and notice, if you will, please, Job 2 and verse number 9. Then Job's wife said to him, Do you still hold fast in your integrity, your singular commitment to trust God in everything? Curse God and die. There is some argument, is that curse or bless? We'll not evaluate that today. Verse 10, But Job said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. 
Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept, and what's the next word in your Bible? Trouble. Trouble? Trouble. Evil on King James. Adversity. Evil? Adversity. Adversity, New King James. In other words, God doesn't just allow good things to happen in our lives. God orders negative things in our lives. God did not miss the scene. God is not in absentia. He is ruling. And so, in the story of Job, the first warning, don't put your hope in other people. The second reality, do we overestimate, do we overestimate or overrate human health. December the 7th, 1941, 7.55 a.m., the Japanese launched an attack on America. 2,353 men died, 960 were missing, 1,272 were wounded, 4,000 casualties in a matter of moments, 177 planes destroyed, and 1,102 men died on the Arizona alone. What lesson do we learn? The lesson that we learn is this. Turn to Psalm 20. Psalm 20. You probably, if you pay attention to the news, are being barraged with the question of, is America preparing for war? Not are we at the door of war, but are, is there a secret move of the government to build up for war? My response is this. There will be a war if God permits it for whatever reason. There will not be a war, regardless of what the politicians want, if God does not allow it. God can restrain and God can constrain. And in Psalm 20, one of the important lessons to learn is where do you put your trust, your security? Do you put it in the bank or God? Do you put it in the stock market or God? Do you put it in the politicians or God? My experience as a pastor is that people always say, we trust in God. And I have found that when things start to go awry, you find out people don't trust God as much as they say they do. That's a nice expression, and on paper it's true. But in shoe leather, it is not always true. Psalm 20 Notice, if you will, please, verse number 7. Psalm 20 and verse number 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. To remember the name of the Lord our God is not to remember His title. Most of us can remember in history, a hundred years ago, there was a company that put out a catalog. And you could buy out of that catalog virtually anything on the American market. And you had confidence that if you bought out of Sears and Roebuck catalog, mm -hmm. you had their name stamped to it. And that was their reputation. When David says, we will remember the name of the Lord our God, what he is saying is, the creator of the universe, the ultimate judge of man, the sovereign, almighty, providential, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent God is where my hope is. Donnie Peoples Name familiar? Gospel singer. Any of you remember this song? He's an on God time. Yes, he is. He's an on God time. 
He may not come when you want him to, but he'll always be right on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. God is seldom early, and he is never late. God has never missed an appointment. God has never found himself trapped by a clock or a calendar to get something done. God has a divine moment at which he intends to show up. Turn back to the book of Genesis, chapter 41. Genesis 41. Genesis 41. Notice, if you will, please, beginning at verse 9. Genesis 41, 9. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants, put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker. We each had a dream, and one night he and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us <coughs> to each man, his interpretation, pardon me, he interpreted according to his own dream. Come down, if you will, please. Verse 14, Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. Pause. Do you realize that for 13 years, Joseph's life is from the pit, to the home of Potiphar, to the prison, to being forgotten. And in one day, one day, God takes him all the way to the top. God did not struggle when he was ready to move. God purposely is waiting for a particular moment. Verse number uh, 16, Pharaoh wanted his dream interpreted. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Verse 28, after the dream is told, this is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Verse 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And now he is gone. From Pitt, from Potiphar, from prison, to the palace. And he is the vizier, prime minister of the entire nation. Greatest nation in the world at that time. Number three. Is human nature dependable in adversity? I grew up in a country home in Georgia, raised by my paternal grandmother. And we had some strange, a number of strange habits, but one in particular, if I was spanked at school, I had the privilege of getting a second spanking from my grandmother. And my grandmother's sister, who lived the equivalent of maybe half a dozen blocks away out in the country, my grandmother's sister, if we got a spanking from my grandmother, she gave us a spanking. And my father's brother lived in Macon, but he would come to Atlanta area, or south of Atlanta where we lived, periodically, and if we had gotten spankings, he rewarded us. One day, my grandmother went out to her car. She had an old DeSoto, and someone had taken a pen, not ink pen, but a straight pen or a nail, and had done a nice job right down the DeSoto. Now, my grandmother did not have a fancy car. This is a, not a beautiful car ruin, but it's one more scratch. 
My grandmother had to go to the funeral. My Uncle Bobby, Dad's brother, said, Mom, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. So he lined all of us up. And he asked the question, Tommy, did you put that scratch on the car? No, I didn't. Brenda, did you? No. Kathy, no. Donna, no. Okay. And so he started with me, and all the way down the line, we all got a spanking. <laughs> then he said, I'm going to ask the question again. Tommy, did you put that scratch on the car? No. Brenda, no. Kathy, no. Donna, no. And all the way down the line, a spanking. This went over, we went through this three or four times. No one confessed. Finally, my sister Kathy, to end the spankings, said, I did it. 25 years later, we found out Kathy didn't do it. Brenda did it. Now, what does that tell you about human nature when we're in the middle of hot water trouble? What do all of us tend to move in the direction of? Try this, self-protection. Take care of number one. That's a problem because God does not have self-protection. God can handle rejection. God can handle, I'm mad at you, God. He can handle all of our human reactions. His concern is his integrity. Take your Bible and look with me in Genesis chapter 8, back a few chapters. Very important phrase, often repeated in the Bible. Genesis chapter number 8. Notice, if you will, please, Genesis chapter 8, Noah is now in the ark. The flood is taking place. The rain has come. We have now reached the highest point, 22 and a half feet above the highest mountain on the face of the earth. And now the ark is floating on the water, waiting for the water to eventually uh, sink back into the ground or the air. Verse 1, Chapter 8, notice these words. Then God, and what's the next word in your Bible? Remembered. Underline it. Then God remembered Noah. Take a concordance sometime and simply take that one word and look at how often in the Bible God remembered. A woman from the land of Moab, which was an enemy of Israel, and God pronounced judgment on them. If a Moabite came to the land of Israel, they had to be in the land as a part of this nation for ten generations to outlive the curse that the Moabites were under. The Moabites existed because when Lot fled from the city of Sodom, he and two of his daughters, in an act of incest, created the Moabites, and the Ammonites. And in the country of Moab is a Gentile woman, alien to the truth of God, alien to the God of the Bible, without hope, without God, a stranger to the covenants of promise. And the Bible says, but God remembered Ruth. You see, for God to remember is not an idea of God's thinking, it is an expression of God's heart. Why did God remember Noah? Because of the covenant God had made with humanity. Why did God remember Abraham? Because of the covenant God made with Abraham. In other words, when the Bible says God remembered, it is not just the idea of, I just caught a scene in history. It is more of I have made a commitment to you and no matter what happens to you, you need not fear. I am committed to you and nothing can change my commitment to you. Jesus told a man dying on the cross, this day you will 
be with me in paradise. And in the worst of adversities, we need to remember two things. Human beings are forgetters. God does not. There's only one thing God does not forget. God said in Hebrews and also in Psalms, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. That is not a statement of God saying, Tom, I remember that night that you walked down that road and you shook your fist at me, but I forgot it. Or Tom, let me tell you some things that you did when you were a teenage boy that you were ashamed of. Let me pull some skeletons out of your closet. But I forgot it. Their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. Is God saying it's not an issue? There is no problem with that. It's done. And the moment that you came to Jesus Christ, your past, your failure, your skeletons were placed under the blood of Christ at Calvary. And God is not holding them against you. There are things that we remember that God says He forgot. Not forgot mentally. Forgot it's not an issue. I never thought that I would come to the stage of life that I have come to, but in the last year, I have remembered things that I did that I long ago forgot that I did. I'm lying on my bed and can't go to sleep, and all of a sudden I remember. I remember, and I remember. And then I say, wait a minute. The God who remembers me does not remember my sin. I have to go back to the Bible. You see, our minds are as much a tool of the devil as our bodies are. There are sins of the flesh and sins of the spirit. And sometimes the sins of the spirit are the worst kind of sins. Because we generally remember people who are hateful, spiteful, ugly, uncaring, self-centered, and we could go on and on and on because motivations create actions. Number four. 